I want you to get one thing, one thing sort of in your mind, and I'm going to give you one word, one word to try to remember it, and that is specific, specific, specific. I've said to our students for years and years, nothing is dynamic unless it is specific. For instance, someone said, uh, I'd like you to have a meal with us sometime. You're not going to get anybody there for a meal. Or I would like for you to uh, meet me somewhere. Where? When? What day? But so many people in God's work try to get things done without being specific. Nothing is dynamic, life-changing. Nothing is dynamic without being specific. Now, we're going to build on one verse of Scripture. Paul is pinning the last things he's going to write. He's pouring out his heart to his son in the ministry. And I think he's all-inclusive. In other words, he's giving this tremendous summary of the passion of his life and ministry. As he writes in 2 Timothy, this that he's writing to his son in the ministry, Timothy. And when you begin what we have as the third chapter, in the last days perilous times shall come, and then this long list of things that characterized last days, he comes down to the 14th verse, and he says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And then, of course, he says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which able to make thee wise in the salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then all scriptures give me inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, we're in God's work. God's work must be done God's way. I'm a pastor. All of my life, God prepared me to be a pastor. That doesn't mean you have to be the oldest of four children and raised in a home where the mother's in charge and, and the left responsibility that really others should be left, but I had to take care of it. That, that doesn't mean that at all. But it means I know in my heart that God prepared me. Unconscious, unconsciously, God prepared me for what he had prepared for me to do. I understand that. And we remove all secondary things and see What's God's intent in this? What's the Lord up to? All these twists and turns. What's God doing? And you know, we, we rule and God overrules. We plan and God changes our plans. And we, we learn to see God's hand in a matter and realize what Paul wrote the church in Corinth, that all things are for our sakes. All things it's all inclusive. Like I was giving the message last evening, I wanted you to understand that every unimaginable thing that happened to that little maid, every bit of it, God used to orchestrate His work in the world that He wanted to accomplish. Now, if you live your life and don't see the Lord in it, you're going to be miserable and confused. But if you can see God in it, it brings such dynamic meaning to your life that it is one grand adventure traveling through this journey with the Lord. We talk so much about the destination and we know we're going to enjoy it, but it's God's intention that we enjoy the journey. And by the way, we're not just to wait until we arrive at some point, some juncture, some age, some time. He wants us to learn to enjoy it all the way through. All the way through. Now, remember about being specific. Think about your own life, what you're teaching, what you teach your children, or instructions you give to a family member, or how you approach your Sunday school class, how we handle the Word of God. And the way God made us. So when God made us, He made us spirit, soul, and body. He created us in His image. 
and he made us to be instructed. He lets us know this in his word because we are to instruct. When Paul was writing this uh, to Timothy, he said to Timothy, as he wrote First and Second Timothy, that we ought to be able to teach others also. So that's what we're trying to do, to instruct others also. Not so that we instruct them, but so that they're able to instruct others, and they're able to instruct others, and they're to instruct others. And all through my life in ministry, I've heard people say things like, uh, well, now we've got a Bible club. Now what's next? More? <laughs> you know? I said to Dr. Robertson years ago when I was working as assistant pastor at Highland Park with him, and I'd finished college at the University of Tennessee and was going to go to Southwestern Seminary as a seminary student and a Southern Baptist pastor. Left the convention after pastoring seven and a half years. My wife and I left the convention. I became an independent Baptist by conviction. And uh, denominationalism can take the place of the Lord Jesus, if you allow it. I'm a Baptist, but I'm not talking about being a Baptist. I'm talking about denominationalism. And the only head of the church should be Christ and Christ alone. And so... I found some problems that I could not reconcile in my own mind with a cooperative program, and on and on it went. But anyway, when I went to Dr. Robertson, I'd been pastoring seven and a half years, and I was all full of vim, vigor, and vitality. And I said, to, uh, Dr. Robertson, I've been here a while, and I, I want you to know <coughs> I got lots of energy, and I want to serve, and you give me anything to do, and I'll, I'll work my best at it. And he said, Well, what I want to do is more of the same. Well, I was frustrated. I didn't want more of the same. I wanted some new thing, like all the Athenians and strangers. I wanted to come and find some new thing to do. More of the same. More of the same. In other words, if you learn to handle the Word of God, to teach the Word of God, you can teach to one person, you can teach to many people. You can start one Bible club. How many can you start from that Bible club? We have a Sunday school with many, many classes in the Sunday school and I could tell you what the attendance is, but we also have Bible studies outside the Sunday school. Right now we have 144 Bible studies during the week, and we want to try to keep moving forward with that. I remember when we first started one, and there are many weeks we have over 2,000 people in those Bible studies during the week. We don't count that in our Sunday school attendance, but we keep a roll. We know who comes. We teach the Word of God. But let's imagine this is our class, and I'm standing and teaching our class, and let's say there's 50 of you in the class. It's absolutely ridiculous for you to hear, 50 of you to hear the Bible lesson and not repeat it to someone. And so we, we print things so that that can be more easily done. We work on this principle. We enlist people to God's great work. If you want to write it down, we enlist people to God's great work. We train them. We equip them. And we continue God's work. There's no stopping place. There's no place to stop. So we come to this word in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14. It says, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. I want you to look at the verse. Just hold your Bible there and look at it. And we apply this now specifically to young people. And I want to talk to you about what what educators refer to as critical thinking, where judgment has been engaged, you come to conclusions, you weigh out the material, and you think, this, I've thought this through, I haven't been, I haven't been sinned against, someone hasn't made me do this. God created us to do critical thinking. I don't mean by that a term that we're critical of people in our thinking, Critical thinking is a term which means that we've synthesized the stuff, we've, we've thought it through, we've taken this into consideration, we've weighed it out, and now these are the conclusions we've reached. We believe this. Now look at that verse. Paul says to Timothy, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. Nothing is real until it's personal, nothing dynamic until it's specific. What do we want to learn? What are we going to learn? Teaching and learning should be synonymous. Don't get the idea because you're standing up in front of somebody and you're teaching, that's all your responsibility. Teaching and learning should be synonymous. You're teaching their learning. 
you're learning someone's teaching. Don't separate those two because if you do, you're going to say, well, I teach a class. Well, are they learning what you're teaching? You see, you should be passionate about their learning just as you're passionate about your teaching. So what do you want people to learn? You want to know about God. The greatest knowledge is the knowledge of God. God's revealed himself. He's revealed himself in conscience and creation. He went further than that. He gave us a written revelation of himself. He gave himself in words. He revealed himself in words. We call that the Bible. It is progressive, meaning in the beginning, God created, but we learn more about God. It is a progressive revelation. It's perfect in the person of Jesus Christ when God actually became a man without ceasing to be God. So the greatest knowledge of God, <clears throat> God reveals himself, enough of the knowledge of God to condemn us in conscience and creation, but specifically he gave us his word so that from generation to generation to generation the word of God is settled forever and God's revealed himself in his word as it progresses, for example, he told a man 100 years old and a woman 90 years old, you're going to have a baby. How absurd, how ridiculous. But before he told them that, he revealed himself as the almighty God. He didn't just jump out one day and say, now you're going to have a baby. He first told them, I am the almighty God. There's nothing I cannot do. Then he said, now 100-year-old man, 90-year-old woman, you're going to have a baby. In other words, all of what we believe grows out of what we know to be true about God. So when you're teaching young people, teaching children, bringing people along, what you're trying to do is impart to them how they can constructively learn about God and know God. That's what you're doing. Now, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. You and I need to be specific about what we're teaching and what we want them to learn. What we want them to learn is synonymous with what we're teaching. What we're teaching is synonymous with what they're learning. So what is it you want them to learn? And why do you want them to learn it? Then he says, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, at the end of the verse, but listen to this in the middle of it. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. That's critical thinking. You see, there's a lot of people today who think they're educators, and I'm not trying to poke fun at people, but I, I studied in college. I became a teacher. I was certified to teach in high school. I was trained as a teacher. I took all the methods courses. I taught in junior high school. Uh, I understand how people learn. I was taught this. But there's a little confusion today. Listen again to the verse. Continue thou in the things thou hast learned and been assured of. There has to be that assured of principle. Now, that's where we have to talk about gates in a moment. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. That's the sources. Where did this come from? What's the source? You see, Satan has attacked the source of all truth, which is God. He's before all things, so all truth proceeds from him. So he's attacked him. When you've attacked God and you, you sort of annihilate God in people's thinking, you don't annihilate him, but in their thinking, you do away with sin. You do away with a fixed point of reference. You do away with all critical thinking. There's no standard from which to judge truth. And so the attack is on God. You're there as a Sunday school teacher, a youth leader, a preacher, a worker, to make people aware of God who says he is the truth, who's declared himself, who's revealed himself not only in conscience and creation, but specifically in words. Every word of God is true. He doesn't tell us everything he knows, but everything he wants us to know about him revealed in his word. And we're to teach that to people. Now, what have they learned? What have they been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them? 
Sources are all important. Let's imagine somebody just wildly states all kinds of things and claims that those things are true and factual, and they're not. They just pull them out of the air. And you run around quoting them everywhere, or I run around quoting them everywhere. We better make sure we've got the facts right, right? So we're here speaking about the true and living God. We need to make sure we've got the truth. What are the sources? Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. There's a lecture I put online so you can listen to this if you want to sometimes. It's more involved in what I'm talking to you about, but I want you to think this through. Once again, not because I've lost my mind, but for repetition, that's the mother of learning. Continue thou, it's personal. You're not just talking to the whole class like this class is a unit and all of you are going to get it. You know it's going to have to be personal. Did she get it? Did he get it? Did you get it? Continue thou and the things thou hast learned. What are these things? Spell them out. Work from a list. Follow God's direction. Put the emphasis where God puts the emphasis. And the things I was learned. You see, people are having church today like somebody cooking that just says, I just throw any old thing in it. Well, you know, you might throw any old thing in it, but how are you going to teach another person to throw any old thing in it? You've got to be specific. Specific. All right? And has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. We know if we're sticking to God's word and we have truthful sources, we can be, we can be confident in those sources, right? Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now let's stop here about being assured of. Look at the verse. Continue thou the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of. How do you come to make something you've heard or learned a part of your life? being assured of. Let me give you an example. Remember when David was going out to fight Goliath and he was offered armor like Saul's army wore? Now, I don't mean to blow your, blow your uh, ideas here, but I don't think Saul was a head and shoulders above other men. I don't think Saul actually handed David his armor. It was the armor like his soldiers wore. Stuff he chose. David said, I have not proved these. I haven't proven this. Now, it wasn't that he approved or proved the slingshot. He was saying, the only thing I know to do battle in is the strength of the Lord. I know to do battle in the strength of the Lord, not in the arm of flesh. This I can be assured of. Because I was no match for the bear, I was no match for the lion, but God gave me victory over the bear and the lion, and it's God I can be assured of. Okay, how do we say, I'm going to stand with authority and teach young people, these are the things I want them to learn and be assured of, knowing they came from God's Word, these are the sources, God's Word, this is what God has said. How do you get to be assured of them? All right? Now, God equipped us to learn. He made us spirit, that's where it all began, soul and body. In our spirit, we have a conscience, and we ought to live at peace there, void of offense toward God and man. Never, never put such pressure on people that they're tempted to sin against their conscience. Better they tell the truth and suffer the consequences. And don't, don't, don't try to overpower people there. You never want people to do that. You don't want them to sin against their conscience. And you're hurting deeply when you do that. But in our spirit, he gave us a conscience, in our spirit the Lord dwells. We're dead in trespasses and sins. And by the way, I believe that Jesus Christ tasted death for every man. And I can go through all the five points of Calvinism and tell you why I refute all five of them the way they're explained. Just want you to know that we ought to make the offer of the gospel to all people no matter what you might have heard someone else say. And that's the way I've always believed, and I'm assured of that. And I work in, a, and I work in parts of the world where other people don't particularly believe that, but I've, I've come to believe that as a conviction. So 
he made a spirit. We were quickened from the dead. In our spirit, once we come to know the Lord as our Savior, Christ lives in us. We have eternal life because the eternal one lives in us. Then we have a soul. In our soul, we have intellect, emotion, and will. And it should follow that pattern, intellect, emotion, and will. Our lives can be so emotionally driven. One of the biggest things we've got to teach young people is they can't trust their emotions. You can't trust your emotions. I'd say nine out of ten times when you're dealing with young people, and that may be an exaggeration, but I don't think it is, you're going to have to say, now look, you've got to do battle with your emotions. You're, you're just crazy about him and you haven't thought the thing through, or crazy about her and thought the thing through, or you want to do this, or you're wildly upset about something. You can't trust your emotions. What are the facts? So in our soul, we work from intellect, emotion, then will. Intellect, emotion, will. We commit to the will, but first intellect, emotion, will. Fact, emotion, then will. Then you have a body. We're more than a body. But the world treats just like we're a body. They say making love involves just the body. No, 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 no. We're more than a body. You have to teach kids you're more than a body. But God gave us a body, and he, he made us a certain way, fearfully and wonderfully made. But more than a body, and we have gates that are on that body. We call them senses, but they're gates. Teach your young people their gates. We don't see with our eyes. We see through them. We don't hear with our ears. We hear through them. We don't taste with our mouth. We taste through it. We don't smell with our nose. We smell through it. We don't touch with our hands. We touch through our hands. Because we're more than a body. So what comes to those gates affects our spirit and our soul. Are we together? Whatever comes to those gates affects our spirit and our soul. I give this illustration all the time. You've probably heard me say it. But I grew up as a kid next to a, for a little while I lived for a short period of time next to a lumber yard. And I can smell fresh cut lumber and I think of where I lived as a child just from the smell igniting something in my soul and my thinking takes me back there. You got that? Maybe you can smell apples cooking and it takes you back to mother's kitchen or something. But see, you're, you're not just smelling with, you're smelling through, and it affects your spirit and soul. So get young people acquainted with the fact of the seriousness of what enters into those gates. And we must be vigilant at all those gates. What you let in that eye gate, ear gate, nose gate, mouth gate. What you let in that touchy gate. You see? Now, I'm going to learn through those gates. I want to make sure truth goes through those gates. And when truth has been proven, when critical thinking has been done, I've weighed it out. I know this is truthful. I know I can trust this person. I know I can trust this word. It's never failed me. I'm assured of it, knowing of whom I've learned it. That's where you want to bring young people. You want to bring them there. And then what they do, this old world that's always appealing to them, always appealing to them. They won't receive all of it. They only receive into their life what they can be assured of, knowing of whom they have learned it. And you must work with this, work with this, always working with this. So I think it ought to be as specific as to say when children are very little, these are the things we want them to learn. And these are the sources we want to point them to. But they must learn it for themselves. It must become real to them. That's where we're assured of it. When I was a student in class, University of Tennessee, the degree I had to work on, I ha had to take anthropology. My anthropology teacher was the third leading physical anthropologist in the nation at the time. Now he's the first. 
He, uh, he's the man who, who invented the body farm for the FBI here in Tennessee. He came from Kansas State to Knoxville when I was a student at UT. He, he, he came up with the idea of the body farm. They bring people from all over the world to study the decomposition of bodies in his body farm. Dr. Bass, I think he's still alive. And uh, I, I had him as a professor. He had convincing arguments. He was a professing Christian that talked against God's word and against the Bible. He was not a rude man. He was a very sincere man. I remember one time talking to him, and he said, you know, you ought to be a preacher. I didn't tell him I always, already was a preacher because he wanted to give the idea that, uh, that only preachers should be witnessing. All Christians should be. I had to take biology, zoology, or zoology. And uh, it just, uh, and geology. And I had yeah, watched these films and I'd watched these convincing arguments put out by oil companies on evolution and all. I mean, and they spent millions of dollars trying to convince people of these things. And I'd sit there and I'd think, oh, you know, what am I to think and believe? Well, there were sources I know that I could be assured of, knowing whom I'd learned them. Do you see what I mean? That anchored my faith. The average, the average in churches that preach the Bible, the average in churches that preach the Bible is 70% of the young people who graduate from high school leave church after they graduate from high school. That's the average. Now, the way to think about that is if it's your children, how would you feel about it? How would you feel? The average. Something happened. They learned or they didn't really learn. It didn't get tested. They're not really assured of it. They still have questions about of whom they learned it. You understand? We had to work on those things. Being specific. Understanding God made gates. That's why there's different types of learners. There's some people who learn better when they touch it. Learn better when they see it. Learn better as they handle it. Learn better as they hear it. Engaging different gates. Now, people have gone media crazy today. In churches, they've gone media crazy. And I think there's a great danger there because we're trying to jump over being assured of. Now, here's where you're going to lose me. I said it, you believe it. 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 In other words, let's, let's close the gap between being assured of. And we can close that gap by making such convincing media arguments or determining how you see it or determining how you, how you look at it. You don't have to think about it. Just accept it. That kind of knowledge will not stand the test when it's tested. So you have a media-driven church. You fasten these images in your mind. Somebody's playing a piano, and we believe you worship God in spirit and in truth, and so we do hymn arrangements because we keep a strong melody line in the song so that you can remember the words because the words communicate the truth of that song. And as they're being communicated, on that strong melody line, you, you're saying the words, thinking of the song, the words speak the truth. But let's imagine, forget about that. We just make some sort of performance out of it, and there's all kinds of pictures going everywhere. We determine what you think by showing it to you. Your mind doesn't have to engage. Just listen. You don't have to be assured of. We're going to plaster it on your brain. That's not going to last, people. It just won't last. Well, people say, well, if we engage more of the senses, we're more apt to, to teach. What are you trying to teach? It's not just teaching. Continue down the things which I've learned and been assured of. That's what we're missing today with young people and youth work. They're not just robots who can repeat back thing to us. Th that's not what we need. We need people who have thought it through are convinced that these are reliable sources and I've made this a part of the fabric of my life. That takes time. It takes the Spirit of God working in people's lives. It's not some microwave deal we do. You understand? 
And if you really want to make an effect for good and for God on our world, I think this is where it has to be done. And may God help us. Now, I'd like to say, without exaggeration, at least ten other things. Matter of fact, this is one point of a 12-point lecture I give. You can watch the lecture online. But maybe you have questions. That's all. Maybe you have questions. Think of the gates, not senses, but gates. Think what you're bringing to those gates, and think of the process a learner is having as you're teaching to make this that you're teaching a part of their life, knowing of whom thou hast learned it and being assured of it. All right? Let's have a question or two before we leave. Anyone? I think the question is how, how, how are they going to use judgment? Let me show you something. Turn to the book of Proverbs just for a moment, okay? And this is, this is a whole different deal. But um, and Proverbs, you know, begins uh, with a man instructing his son and ends with a woman instructing his son. But there, there are certain things that God deals with here in the book of Proverbs. And uh, if you look at it, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice and judgment, equity, to give subtly to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Now, there are, there are certain, ten certain things that, that are dealt with here. Judgment, discretion, subtlety, all these different things. They're all pointed out all through the book of Proverbs, 31 chapters in Proverbs. Uh, to receive, in other words, a person is supposed to know, I'll hear this, but I won't receive that into my life. I'm not going to make that a part of the fabric of my life. How did you learn? You gained confidence in sources. You know, admiration, uh, I'm trying to use biblical illustrations, okay? Let's look back again at 2 Timothy uh, chapter, uh, chapter uh, 3. Notice Paul is... He's writing the last thing. He says to Timothy in verse 10, For thou hast fully known my, what's the first thing on the list? Doctrine. Then he says, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions. Now, that's a list, but the first thing on the list is doctrine. Now, he says, Timothy, don't go any further if the doctrine's not right. You see? But now, and we, we say, yeah, and I'm, I'm glad, amen, that's wonderful. But what is the doctrine? You want to know how you've succeeded your Sunday school class? Get one of your young people been in church 12 years. Tell you what propitiation is. Or redemption. Or adoption. I, I think people, after listening to somebody teach the Bible for years, ought to have a reasonable idea that they should know something about Bible doctrine. And defend, you know. Now, I'm condemning myself in this too. I'm just telling you, you know, a lot of this is just uh, speaking to the grandstand sometimes. Specifically, what are those kids being taught that they're really being taught that they can teach others? I, I believe we've got to get serious about the whole thing again, you know. And may God help us. You pray for us here at the Temple Baptist Church. Pray for us at Crown College. Send young people to us. This isn't the only school. Anybody that works here that says that, they're nuts. And honestly, it's not. This isn't for everybody, but I think it's for a lot more people than you might imagine. But we want to teach people the truth and have them continue thou in the things thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. I don't want them to follow me. I want to follow the Lord. 
They'll be able to take the word of God. They said, Brother Sexton said something's not exactly lined up. Or at least, I'm not there yet. I'd like to know more about that. That's okay. That's okay. I don't want to overpower them. And so, let's care more about God's reputation than we do our own. He'll take care of ours. We take care of His. Oh, there's so many things. You've got to get to another class. And they'll have better things to say than I've said. So, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Guide and help us. And bless, continue to bless, we pray, this conference in Jesus' name. Amen.